Mother, nine, eight, nine. Welcome to 989 on Health, a show where you don't need years at university to understand the latest news about health and related subjects. An important announcement for our listeners. This podcast is intended to be an informal tool for laymen and practitioners alike to hear our viewpoints on health and wellness. Don't rely on the information in this podcast as an alternative to medical advice from your doctor or other professional healthcare provider. For the full disclaimer, please see our website. I'm Mike Davalos, just a guy, an average Joe, and I'm joined by the opposite of average, Brandon Weintraub, a primary care physician. Good morning, Brandon. And good morning to you, sir. How are you this fine day? Doing fairly well. Nice, uh, simple week so far. Good. Uh, our topic for today is electronic cigarettes. Usually it's just called vaping. I really knew nothing about vaping before I started researching for this episode. Uh, there's a lot more to even a, a simple e-cigarette than I realized. Here's what I've gathered. Uh, These e-cigarettes are complex little machines. There's a battery connected to a heated atomizer coil with a wicking material like cotton inside, and various liquids which may or may not contain nicotine. Uh, They're applied to the coil, which turns that heated liquid into a vapor that you inhale. Uh, Do I have that right? I honestly didn't know about the cotton wicking material, but I guess it makes sense. I've run across e-cigarettes that can use dried tobacco or herbs as well. I read that a Chinese research pharmacist is credited with the creation of the modern e-cigarettes, and he was working for a company that specialized in ginseng. Uh, Is this true? And if so, uh, why is the invention used for tobacco rather than ginseng or some other herb? Well, there are a number of reasons, but uh, in fact there are e-cigarettes that you can get herbal supplements for, as well as tobacco. But monetization and dose regulation is playing a big part in what the public sees. Tobacco is a really big industry, with the money and marketing face time to make e-cigarettes a really popular item. While vaporizing herbal blends has been a practice for a long time, it's never really had the attention of the media except in instances where a tragedy occurs, or as a cigarette alternative, which is where the practice is getting its latest push in society. As a practitioner though, the bigger concern to me is the lack of quality, dose, and ingredient regulation. It's a wonderful thought to be able to use vaporized herbals to provide a quick delivery method for supplements and formula into the bloodstream, but there has to be more caution involved than what we see right now. Herbal medicines, like the ones your acupuncture physician might prescribe to you, have been honed over many years for specific conditions in specific circumstances. They're not nearly as dangerous as most pharmaceuticals in terms of negative side effects, but there's always the risk that If you use the herbal medication incorrectly, or if you're using it in conjunction with other medications, you can still see some significant downsides. The doses that are suggested when using a tinctured remedy or a decocted remedy are not necessarily correct or safe doses if you try to inhale those herbs. So while there are a few companies out there offering herbal oils for e-cigarettes, the lack of attention and feasible regulation has really mitigated their popularity. Seems like the great majority of e-cigarettes are pre-made. Uh, they're disposable. They're about the same size and shape of the normal cigarettes we're all familiar with, made of paper and tobacco that you light with fire. Uh, now, in the beginning, the idea behind vaping seems to have been uh, to help people stop smoking, since it's easier to adjust the amount of nicotine very precisely, and you wean yourself from your cravings over a period of time. I think the big question is, do e-cigarettes actually help people stop smoking? Or is it just a tobacco alternative for times when you need that nicotine hit, but you're in some environment uh, where smoking's not allowed, which is most places these days? Well, I would usually try my best to find a whole variety of research articles and then get some opinions and then get some personal stories and make my answer based on the evidence available. Unfortunately, for this particular question, I can't do it because the evidence just doesn't exist. A few very recent studies are showing some benefits to a person's health if they use e-cigarettes instead of regular cigarettes, but the results are preliminary at the very best and lacking in a fair number of ways. To my knowledge, no study to date has shown any significant increase in cessation of smoking as compared to any other method available, including nicotine patches or cold turkey. Right now, and this is purely my opinion, E-cigarettes are basically a trendy new way to get a dose of nicotine that, as a bonus, 
happens to be considered less offensive to others and may be better for your health. Maybe. Smoking cigarettes is smelly, dirty, and increasingly socially unacceptable. But vaping is super cool, right? And does this cool, trendy new way of smoking actually attract those impressionable young folks into getting addicted to nicotine? It's certainly possible that this new, hip, high-tech method of smoking is appealing to the younger generations and going to create a new generation of people addicted to vaping. It isn't any worse, though, than when cigarettes were originally introduced and marketed. Uh, In fact, I'd argue that even with this new trend, we may be in a slightly better place than with the original cigarette. Modern medicine has managed to give the average person at least a basic understanding now of how bad smoking actually is for you. That hasn't stopped people from picking up the habit, but at least the forewarning is better than when cigarettes first hit the scene, when it was considered safe, fun, and harmless. With this most recent reintroduction of vaporizer pens and e-cigarettes, we still have that knowledge. The theory is that they are better for you than cigarettes, but there is the implicit understanding, I hope anyway, uh, it may be a pipe dream of mine, that it is still not healthy or safe to be inhaling foreign substances. If nothing else, there are liquids on the market that have 0% nicotine content, which means that even if the inhalation of the vaporized carrier, whether it's oil, glycerin, or something else, even if it is damaging to the lungs, at least the body isn't being flooded with additional substances which directly affect the user's entire body. Although, to be honest, that's probably a pipe dream as well. There is currently no way of knowing what the long-term effects of even the most basic carrier and flavorings will have when inhaled regularly. The data simply doesn't exist yet. I've heard some folks say that vaping helped them quit smoking completely, and now they're getting their nicotine fix from vaping. Does this really count as quitting? Is it like saying, I'm not drinking Everclear anymore, now I just drink beer all day? Or is there actually a significant difference? Well, if they mean that they quit smoking regular cigarettes, then of course they've quit. There are potential benefits to looking at the switch from regular cigarettes to e-cigarettes in a positive light. Regular cigarettes include a variety of toxic substances besides nicotine, uh, including lead, arsenic, formaldehyde, and if you want the full list, we'll provide a link on our website. And these substances have been proven to be extremely harmful. For the most part, these substances are not present in e-cigarette liquids, a net gain for smokers overall. However, as I mentioned in a previous question, the regulation and research of the substances being used for e-cigarettes isn't developed yet. So while it seems on the surface like a good idea to switch from regular smoking to vaping, there are still a lot of variables to account for. You also mentioned that the people you know are still using vapor liquids with nicotine added, which means the primary addictive substance in cigarettes is still being introduced into their bodies. And in that case, no, they haven't actually quit anything, any more than if they had started using the nicotine patch and, rather than weaning down, just kept using the same dose. I would go over the full list of negative side effects of nicotine on the body, but it's a fairly sizable list. I'll just direct our listeners again to our website to find a link to a great research study on the topic. One thing that occurred to me when I was reading about the e-liquid or e-juice that you're breathing in, uh, one of the ingredients is vegetable glycerin, which provides a naturally sweet taste. And it should, since glycerol is categorized by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics as a carbohydrate, and it has about the same calories as table sugar. So maybe vaping is better than smoking because you're not getting the tar or other negative components of classic cigarette smoke. But how would it affect my blood sugar, especially if I'm diabetic or pre-diabetic? That's a great question, especially with my already established concerns about the seriousness of diabetes and its control in the U.S. And the answer is, ready for it? We don't know for sure. Nicotine has been shown to potentially have a statistical link with increased HbA1c levels. So it may potentially have an effect on diabetes. The glycerin, while a carbohydrate, is processed very differently when inhaled than if it had been sent through the digestive system, and so it should have very little effect on the blood sugar. But the key word is should. Can I interrupt you for a second to have you explain to me what HbA1c is? I was actually going to do that, but I wasn't sure if 
I was really qualified to necessarily make that. Like, is it a hormone? Is it a... Okay, so the HbA1c test is actually a... It's a test that looks for glycated hemoglobin, okay. which is basically shattered parts of the red blood cell. When you have sugar in your bloodstream, that sugar actually tends to literally break the red blood cells. And so your glycated hemoglobin is up. Oh, is this a way to kind of check not your blood sugar for today, but your blood sugar lately? Over the past period of time. So usually it measures anywhere between one month to, I think, most people will get it even sometimes yearly, just to get a general idea of whether their blood sugar has been up or down. In general, yeah. There are a number of other things that affect HbA1c. But for some reason, in the modern medical world, that test has become synonymous with glucose regulation problems. But anything that can affect red blood cells, anything that increases the glycated uh, hemoglobin, can lead to an increased HbA1c level. So blood diseases, uh, anything that uh, destroys or changes the shape of red blood cells, um, all of that can have a direct effect on your HbA1c. So my question really is, I was only able to find one significant study that directly related nicotine to blood sugar problems, and it was using the HbA1c test. But how do we know that the nicotine or something else in the cigarettes weren't damaging the red blood cells some other way rather than adjusting blood sugars? And I wasn't able to find an answer. There, there didn't seem to be any significant direct testing done on glucose content in the blood. So to me, the study that showed that it was related was questionable. I'm, I'm going to link back to Chinese medicine just because I think the parallel is useful as an example. Acupuncture and herbal medicines used in modern practice have been tested on a fairly wide scale for long periods of time. While they may not have gone through the current Western scientific method officially, they have nonetheless been used for long enough that their basic outcomes can be predicted when used within the medical framework they were designed for. The same can't be said for so much of what is being applied to our food and medical practices today. That doesn't mean that things are being done wrong, but it does mean that things that should be safe or appear to be harmless haven't been tested in the most complicated laboratory there is, the human body. So even though the short-term effects seem to have no direct influence on diabetes as it stands, we may find a very different picture once glycerin has been inhaled multiple times a day, every day, for 20 years. I'll tell you this for certain. Medications, food source modifications, and lifestyle changes that we're making now will still be surprising doctors and scientists 50 years from now. There are the disposable, classic, uh, cigarette-sized e-cigarettes, and then there's this whole other world of vaping, where the devices get a lot bigger, a lot more complex. There seems to be a thriving ecosystem of parts, equipment, and options uh, to build and modify or mod uh, your equipment, and it's it looks like it's becoming a major hobby and pastime for a lot of people. There's some really cool designs. I mean, some even look like the sonic screwdriver you see on Doctor Who. Any thoughts on this? I actually think it is potentially a good thing. As we gain better understanding of the implications and ramifications of vaping, we'll be able to more easily apply new features to improve their safety and use. Once a little research has been done as to their application for herbal remedies and supplements, specially designed parts and cartridges um, to ensure dose regulation and maintenance of sterile environment if we need it, it should be quick, easy, and cheap to manufacture and provide. If a safety issue is found, it will hopefully mean ease of transition to a newer and safer version of products already in use. No need to buy another $500 unit to implement a better design, or wait years for the big companies to completely redesign their product and manufacturing processes. Just buy a $40 mod, as you called them, and there you go. While I doubt the general population will ever go much further than enjoying quick change parts, it still opens the possibilities for future adaptations. This is going to sound odd to think about, and this is never going to happen, but if a high school or a college could get away with it, designing and building your own vaping device in class would be a great series of science lessons in physics. 
there's just so much science to them, and it's a subject that a lot of young people would actually find interesting and useful. Vaping as a gateway to addiction could be bad, but for a compelling piece of science, it's got a lot going for it. I can definitely see some potential, but go ahead and elaborate a bit more for me. Okay, so you've got a tank for the e-liquid or e-juice. Uh, you've got the chemistry of that liquid itself to explore. You've got the coil atomizer, the tubes, the dripper, the wick, the batteries. You're learning about voltage and watts and milliamp hours and transistors and microchips. Uh, one video I watched even suggested learning about Ohm's law, which is about conductors and resistance and voltage. Uh, and just to be clear, uh, adjusting the electricity that hits the coil in a very controlled way has a big impact on the experience of vaping. Uh, the flavor, the throat hit, the amount of nicotine, how warm or cool the vapor is. The concern isn't about trying to save battery life like it is with your smartphone, because getting the right amount of electricity to the coil is vital to your enjoyment, which is why a lot of the really complex mods have these big square blocks for the batteries. And I really can't think of another trendy modern hobby that cares about electricity so much. Maybe some really dedicated DJs out there are trying to learn some electrical engineering to fix an old Moog synthesizer they found at a flea market. But even that, it's an edge case. Uh, what do you think? I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, although there does seem to be a recent surge in hobbyist-built electronic devices, uh, like arcade games or automated systems for your house, that kind of thing. The concepts involved in something so seemingly small and simple have the potential to provide a spark of interest in a wide variety of scientific fields. Uh, I know it does for me, and it's one of the reasons I made the push for this to be an episode so quickly. Uh, technology, medicine, even the sociological impacts in the e-cigarettes integration into modern society. Uh, vaping will be something worth keeping an eye on. In my reading, there seemed to be a lot of concern with better cloud production or being a cloud chaser, as if getting your hit of nicotine was fine, but it's almost more important to be blowing impressive clouds, smoke rings, balls, streams, ripples tricks, uh, all as part of a performance piece. Uh, and clearly for some people it is not just to do it, but to be seen doing it and do it well. Uh, people take a lot of time and money to trick out their mod with fancy cases, materials, lights, colors. Uh, there's even competitions, blow cool clouds and do, do neat tricks. Uh, it's a game of one-upmanship like tricking out your car for street racing or chasing some other fashion trend. Uh, any thought on this? And if there are health concerns, how much does the trendy nature of vaping concern you? In my opinion, smoking has never really just been about getting your daily dose of nicotine. If it were, no one would have ever adopted it. Some other less uncomfortable method of delivery would definitely have been invented. Smoking is also considered a way to interact with others, be accepted by a social group. It's a way to get additional breaks throughout the workday. It's been touted as a pleasure activity from the very beginning. And like any pleasure activity, people will always be chasing that next neat thing, to be better or different than the others who are a part of the same group as they are. If smoking, e-cig or otherwise, is acknowledged as unhealthy, dangerous, and nothing more than a person's choice, and if the negative effects of smoking can be avoided by those around them choosing not to engage in that activity, then the fact is that trendy comes down to a personal choice, which I won't debate because there will always be conflicting opinions. I am concerned, however, that e-cigarettes are being seen as a healthy alternative, or are at least being cast in that light for now. Buca aficionados have been searching for the better cloud for ages, but it wasn't seen as healthy, just different. If e-cigarettes are taken up as a delivery system for medicine, or continue to be seen as harmless, that's where I see the trendiness becoming an issue. The last thing we want is for patients to pick up their e-cigarette, which they have used solely for entertainment, which has been modded to allow for maximum smoke generation, and then plug in their medical cartridge to be dosed with who knows how much. Even a basic herbal remedy couldn't be considered safe. There are also a lot of interesting options when you're modding your vape gear to build your own coils out of raw wire. Uh, you know, you discover and test out new wicking materials, uh, whip up your own recipe for the oil you load your tank with. I think you mentioned in a recent episode how something as simple and everyday as burnt marshmallow can have carcinogens in it. All the modding really is interesting to me, and it does sound like good crafting fun, uh, but I can see a lot of opportunities to make mistakes in all this. Uh, you can have battery failures, create some kind of rancid oil, breathe in some kind of weird heavy metal, not the music kind, the poison kind, uh, impurities from the wire. Maybe you run out of the correct solder and you use some old solder you find in the garage, which 
is the kind with lead in it, or some unknown pesticides or herbicides from the cotton or the wool you're trying out for a wick. Uh, since you can't really control the mining, agriculture, and battery industries, you really have no control over this weird cocktail that you've decided to inhale. Uh, do you have concerns about the mods, or am I being overly cautious? Uh, I guess you could voice all these same concerns about mm, creating your own cookies from scratch. That's very true, and the sad fact is that a person can never know that what they're doing is completely safe. When baking cookies, you could get a batch of poorly stored flour and get food poisoning. Or the milk you have could have soured. Or the spinach you use to make your cookies. Yeah, that's right. Spinach oatmeal cookies. What of it? I'll put a link on the website. Well, that spinach might have Giardia. I would argue the risks of building your own vaporizer are a bit more significant for your average person. Get a recipe, buy the ingredients, and make some cake. And for the most part, the dangers are burns and awful flavor. But building or modding your own e-cigarette involves electricity and possibly extremely high voltage. And without a very firm grasp of metals and toxins and how these affect the lungs, the average person isn't going to know exactly what they're exposing themselves to. The lungs are also a more direct pathway for substances into the bloodstream than the digestive tract, so pathogenic and dangerous substances that might not have been a problem if you had just eaten them, or had just been exposed to them through touch, can be extremely dangerous when they're inhaled. One thing that definitely worries me, I've seen some models that really promote pass-through charging as a handy feature, and this is where you can charge the battery for the vaping device and use it at the same time. Now I remember, I'm old, uh, I remember the days when cell phone manuals recommended against using the phone while you're charging it. Uh, there's probably a very small chance of a problem, but it was a smart idea. Just don't hold a volatile battery to your head while you're charging it. Similarly, uh, it seems like a bad idea to charge your e-cigarette battery, especially a mod where you might be really pushing the battery, chasing that ever higher high while sucking the fumes out of it. Uh, batteries work because of complex chemistry and physics, and they can catch on fire, as was a big problem recently with the Samsung Galaxy Note phones. That's very true. There are also practitioners out there who question whether or not all this active electricity that we're exposing ourselves to on a daily basis is leading to health problems of its own. As always, opinions seem to conflict. I know I feel safer not having devices plugged in while I use them. Vaping is not a new idea, and it's been around for some time. The latest iteration, though, seems to have really struck a chord, especially here in the U.S., and it's likely here to stay. For now it seems to be a healthier alternative for smokers when compared to regular cigarette use, and it seems to be more accepted for use while in public. If you're already a smoker and want to try something that may impact your health a little less, or you're looking for maybe another possible method to reduce your nicotine intake, or maybe stop smoking altogether, e-cigarettes may be a useful tool and a possibly viable option. However. I really urge our listeners to recognize that they're still inhaling foreign chemicals into their lungs, and the mid to long term effects are still completely unknown. Don't follow the hype of vaporizing being healthy and consequence free. If you decide to try it or use it as an alternative to your current habit, you're still taking risks that may adversely affect you in ways medicine can't yet determine. The healthiest choice is to avoid smoking altogether. And if, at some point in the future, or even if you try it now with available remedies, you find that e-cigarettes are implemented as a tool to deliver medicine, make sure to remember that you're changing your body chemistry, and following correct dosage and medical advice will always be key to making sure you're balancing the risks with the benefits. That's all the time we have for today. These are short episodes that provide a brief overview of very complex topics. Everything we say is for entertainment and educational purposes only. Licensed healthcare professionals should advise you and be aware of changes you make to any aspect of your healthcare. Every person's needs are different. The links to references we've made about news articles, medical studies, or other materials can be found at level989.com slash health, along with our contact information and the complete don't take medical advice from podcasts disclaimer. Thanks for listening, and now go help yourself. Thank you.